in your, anyway, um, in 1996. Whoa, in, we're going way back. <laughs> no, no, Who I, was not alive I, then? I was given permission. Um, Steve and I had uh, three little girls. The youngest was Still only do. five months old, and Steve was doing music um, for this. Uh, ladies meeting actually and because I had a five month old who was still nursing I went to slip out of the back to um, go to the nursery and check on Megan and it, there was probably there were several hundred people there and I had just helped Steve sing and as I was leaving the the speaker said Tammy and I thought I'm getting in trouble for walking out right before she's going to talk and I kind of I turned it you know I was a little freaked out and she looked at me and she said Tammy you're pregnant I didn't even know it. And so I, I over, yes, with vision. over the 300 people, I went, no, because I had a five month old little, little girl. And I, that was not on either one of our radars. Um, but she said, you're pregnant and it's a boy. So I was like, okay, I'll listen. Cause you know, I had three girls. I'll listen. And she said, it's a boy. And so I turned around and she said, I need you to come up here. She said, you're going to have a son and I'm going to give him a special gift. He's going to be musical and he's also going to be very prophetic. He's going to be a man of God. Raise him well because I have a plan of God for his life. And so that young man is David. And I wanted to tell that story to you because today is a, a significant step forward in what I truly believe. Um, how old are you? 26? <laughs> <laughs> for the last 26 years, I have four kids. I'm sorry, I can't remember all their ages. But for the last 26 years, just as, you know, being his mother and praying for him and the plan of God that um, he has for David's life, today just is is a major day, and you guys are all here for a first. So you yeah, can go. Yeah, come over here between us, Dave. Um, as most of you know, he is our student pastor, along with his wife, Corinne. Wave at everybody, Corinne. Um, and she actually spoke this past Wednesday for the first time to the, to the group. And from what I understand, she tried to get revival to break loose and, and send them running around the building and everything. But uh, David may tell you the story of how this wound up happening today. But um, he is our student pastor, so it's good for you to hear what your kids are having imparted to them. And also these neighborhood kids. There are quite a number of young people, students that come on Wednesday night whose families are not part of our church. So... They're here every week. They don't. They vote with their feet, and their feet keep bringing them here every Wednesday. So it's an incredible thing to see. But we wanted to pray for him uh, before he gets started. Lord knows I prayed enough this week, but now I just want to do it in front of all you guys. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that your hand is on David and his life. We thank you for clarity, purpose, focus, Father, as he listens to your spirit today, as he's prepared. Father, let him speak like there's nothing but the spirit. But what he's prepared and what he's put in his heart, Father, we ask that it come out in such a way that it penetrates every listening ear and every receptive heart. We thank you for this day and what it begins in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement, say amen. Amen. Well, this better be good, huh? How about that? Okay. Well, we're going to be in Psalm 89. So if you've got your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you're in Genesis, go right. If you're in Revelation, go left. Um... But I'll say while you're turning, I had a difficult time trying to find where I was going to land and what I was going to talk about. Um, I'm kind of at this in-between age where like, I'm somewhat removed from the student's age, you know, where we give them really practical, applicable things to what kids that age go through. But I'm not yet at like, this wise adulthood, parenthood season yet. So in my own studies, I love theology. I don't want to bring something confusing and deep that I would probably just butcher up here. So I think Psalm 89 will be a good place for us to jump out of um, and just talk about God a little bit, if that's okay. So we'll start in Psalm 89. I'll read the first just nine verses. Then we'll pray and we'll get started. So I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, steadfast love will be built up forever, and in the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. And you, God, have said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one, and I've sworn to David, my servant, that I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. So let the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, and your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? And who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, Lord, with your faithfulness all around you? You rule the raging of the sea, and when its waves rise, you still them. 
So let's pray. God, would you just speak to us this morning? We just want to know you deeper. We long to hear from you. Thank you for your word. Amen. So that starts off with saying, with my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. So clearly he's standing from a place where he full and wholeheartedly believes that God is faithful. And I want to point out verse 3, because I think that gives a little bit of an indication as to why he says that. So there's a direction, and not guidance, but direction, like cardinal direction in this. So you see, he says, you, God, have said that I've made a covenant with my chosen one, and I've sworn to David, my servant. So he's saying God is faithful because God made a promise and God is going to keep that promise. So I'm going to start here simply with the fact that God is faithful. Yep, so it's super deep and insightful, right? I would venture to say that most of us here would make that claim and we would stand and we'd say that God is faithful. Um, But then why do we struggle with faith is a good question. If we believe God to be faithful, What's the problem? You know, why do we wrestle with faith? Why do we wrestle with doubt? So I grew up in this church, and I was taught about faith. I was taught faith well. Um, and, you know, all the verses like we live by faith and not by sight. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But so you tell a kid, hey, you know, with faith you can move a mountain, and so you don't expect me to go home, sit in my room, and like directionally channel faith to try and move an action figure, right? Because I'll do that. Um, so, you know, you go home, you sit there. You just lock in on Spider-Man or whatever, and you just, like it's, you know, you got a Christian superpower when you got faith, right? So you're trying to move it, and nothing happens. So as a kid, you just brush it off, and you're like, well, I probably didn't have enough faith, maybe. Like, what is actually the aspect ratio of mustard seed to some internal force? You know, probably short. Um, But then you get a little bit older, you hear all the stories of faith in the Bible, famously Peter for walking on water. And you're like, okay, well, this makes sense. Faith plus faith focus. He was looking at Jesus. Maybe that's the recipe. That's the formula. So I can remember many times in the summers with my friend who would come over, we would like, dude, do you want to try it? Like, (laughs) We're at the swimming pool. So we'd need to give each other a pep talk. It's like, dude, okay, how much faith do you have? I'm like, bro, I got got a lot. I got so much faith and I've like not asked for anything all year. Like I'm just saving it for this. (laughs) And you're like, okay, well, so we got that covered. Now we just got to, you know, be focused, right? So you get to the edge of the pool, and you're like, okay, one at a time, because just, just one, one at a time. So I'm first, you know, you can touch the water, right? And, you know, water, like, will give a little bit before it breaks over your foot. So I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm buoyant today, like, I'm feeling good. But then you're like, well, no, 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 got to focus. Gotta, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's Jesus, it's not me. So you get to the edge, and you're like, okay, face, right? And you step out, and then what happens? A splash, right? So you know, you're floating back to the surface and you audit that process. You're like, okay, well, where'd I go wrong? I know I had enough faith. Like if it's just a mustard seed, that'll do something crazy. Like I'm just full of faith. It's crazy. And you're like, well, you know, I'm, there's probably something wrong with me. Like, cause if I had enough faith, you know, maybe my focus isn't full. Just something's off. And so you can see how as you grow up and you're applying faith to more real things, you can get a bit cynical towards yourself and maybe even towards God. Like if you get older and then something doesn't happen, you're like, okay, did I not have enough faith? Did God not hear me? Is there something wrong with me? Does God even exist? I mean, it seems like a stretch, but that would just be the trajectory that that sets you up on. So it begs the question of what exactly is faith? If God's faithful, what am I doing wrong? So I don't want to necessarily talk about God being faithful. I want to back up and say, okay, do I need to check my own understanding of faith? What exactly am I working with here? So to know what faith is, I think we'll start with where it comes from, because the Word clearly tells us that. In Romans 10, 17, Paul wrote that faith comes from hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. So what can we take from that? If faith came from hearing, then it didn't come from me, right? It didn't originate in me. I didn't create faith that I could send out and have something done. Faith came to me in response to hearing the Word, which is what? It's God's will. It's God's nature. He's self-defined through this book, and he's made promises. And so faith is what I have in response to hearing what the Word says. And so in that, an answered prayer doesn't necessarily always look like I think it will. I'll give kind of a silly example, and you're the butt of the joke. Um, So my dad does not cook. He's never told us that he would cook. I mean, he can, I'm sure, but he doesn't claim to be a chef. That's just not his thing. And so let's say I'm younger, 
and I'm at home, and I'm hungry, and my dad's there, and I'm like, Dad, I'm, I'm hungry, and I know what I need. You know, I need you to cook, like, chicken Florentine or something, right? I'm like, that sounds good. I want that right now. So I've got faith in you, right? And I, I'm going to use my faith for the Florentine, right? <laughs> and, and so I sit there, and I'm just, you know, little me, like, I've got the faith, and this is going to happen, and I'm so hungry. There's no way he's going to ignore me. But then, you know, you don't hear any knives chopping in the kitchen. You don't hear the stove light up. Don't hear any pots and pans come out. I'm like, well, where's, where's my dad at? He doesn't, he's not listening to me. And so you get louder and you're like, Dad, I'm serious. I need this because I'm hungry, right? Well, he's not a cook. He never made a promise to me that he would make me chicken Florentine when I got hungry. But he told me he would take care of me. And so, you know, maybe then a few minutes later, he comes in with some takeout or something, right? Like, and he met my need, but I'm so consumed with what I thought I wanted that I'm disappointed in that gift, Right? Real life example, I needed a car in high school because my sisters were all older. When they went off to college, I was like, all right. But I said, I knew what I needed. It was, a, it was an F-150, a newer one. <laughs> and, and I remember, I, I, you know, I grabbed a Bible verse. I was like, okay, I think it's John 15. Jesus says, hey, if you abide in me, my words are abiding in you. You can ask for what you need and get it. And I was like, okay, well, his words abide in me. I got this one. And I would lay in bed and just just ruminate on it, and I'm, and I'm picturing the Ford, and I'm saying the verse, and as the months went by, like, things were coming in motion, I could, you know, I would send my dad a car, and I'd be like, look at this one, he's like, yeah, that's not quite right, but you know, you're on the right track, and I mean, they were saying, yeah, you do need a car, you do need a car, and I'm like, yeah, this is working, this is working, praying, praying, and you, all my faith that I can muster up for this Ford, and then one day I got the keys to an 03 Kia Rio, and... <laughs> And of course, I'm disappointed in God, not in my parents, but I'm like, well, dude, I'm like, well, you know, this, this, is not, this is not what I needed. But can I maybe submit to us that God knows better than we know, right? And his ways are higher than ours because in hindsight, thank God I drove irresponsibly and broke the Kia and not an expensive <laughs> Ford, right? You're hearing me on that. So God's ways are higher than you. But Hear me clearly on this. The message of the gospel is not that we need to lower our requests or our expectations to God. It's not that we should ask for less and then thus be not disappointed. Because scripture tells us exactly the opposite. Jesus said, hey, my father in heaven knows what you need before you've even asked. And then Paul writes that God can do exceedingly and abundantly what more than I could ask. So if he knows what I need before I ask. And he can do more than I can even think to ask. I should probably just trust that he could take care of the need. So God can and will do more than we could think, but God is not like a faith store cashier. You know, he doesn't run a desk with you know, miracles and material things behind him that we can get out our faith wallet and spend it on. And faith is not manifesting. Like I can't just summon up faith, send it out, and it returns exactly what I think I needed. But so obviously these are kind of silly examples and, you know, stuff that you see in youth. But as we grow up, we have real serious needs, don't we? And so what we need to do then is not be standing on false faith. Because if I've set God up my entire life on these pass-fail faith tests, based on what I think I need, I've damaged my trust in my relationship with Him. So that when I have something I really need, I'm not looking to the Word for what I can have. Right? So I'm thankful that faith comes from the Word because the Word basically covers everything we could need, doesn't it? It's full of promises and full of God's self-definition. But so if faith comes from hearing, then I need to hear more of the Word, right? So my first point is that faith is the fruit of intimacy. So faith comes the better you know somebody, right? And that's not just the written Word, right? Do you believe that God's voice is still active? Because it is, <laughs> Right? So God's word, written word, is alive and active, but his voice has never gone dormant. Right. Psalm 19 says that the skies are declaring the glory of the Lord, and the heavens are proclaiming the work of his hands. And those Greek words there for those um, personified speech, it's, it's not just talking about they say things. It's an eternal, not repetitive, but continuous, essentially a lesson on who God is and what he's capable of doing. And so I've wondered... Like with this example here, does anybody know someone who can just pick up in an instant like what song is playing? Like they could beat Shazam anytime. I saw this video, this girl, 
And they were just shuffling like the entire catalog of Taylor Swift, like as far back as you can think to the newest stuff. And before I could even tell you there was music on, like she knew by the duration of the silence from start to first, like what song it was. It was crazy. And, you know, I mean, people who can like look at art and just by brush strokes, like discern, you know, exactly who painted something because they're so well versed and studied in that person's handiwork that they would recognize it from anywhere. So if like Psalm 19 says, day after day, they're pouring forth speech and night after night, they're revealing knowledge. You know, maybe I need to take a step back and grow in intimacy with God so that my ears are tuned to that frequency. Because I may stand and say, you know, I have a need, but I mean, God did not specifically say what to do in this situation. Well, I'll tell you, he's willing to give you real fresh direction and a new word, but maybe we need to calibrate ourselves to be in that, you know, that heavenly wavelength where we can pick up on these sort of things, you know, because I don't want to, you know, miss a sound if it's passing by my ears, but I'm not close enough with God that it's not catching my ears. I don't want to be in that position because God is always speaking. Um, I want to look at Hebrews chapter 11. I didn't give the verses to it. Um, if you're not familiar with it, probably from the second you started reading it, you would recognize it. Sometimes, you know, it's nicknamed like the Hall of Faith, right? Because it just lists all these characters throughout Scripture who have stood in faith and seen things happen. I'm going to just cherry pick some verses and, you know, we'll, we'll glean something from it. So, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events unseen, constructed an ark. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place he was to inherit. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah received the power to conceive. 17, by faith, Abraham again, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Verse 32, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, David, and Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. It goes on, and there's plenty more examples in there. But when I wanted to point out all these like heroes of the faith, what do they all have in common? It was a word and direction from God that they are committed for their faith for standing on. Right? Noah didn't wake up one day in the middle of that drought and say, let's make ourselves look stupid and build a boat for the next couple hundred years. Right? Joshua didn't say, I know what's going to take down the walls of Jericho if we walk around it like some, some weirdos. And Abraham didn't say, hey, Sarah, you know, we're 75. We should, we should plan on having a baby uh, when we're 100, right? <laughs> they had all gotten revelation in a word and a direction from God, and they're commended on their faith for following that. It wasn't their own dream and vision. It wasn't their own plan and idea. It was what God told them. But see, I want to point out Abraham... He had a long waiting period, he and Sarah, between the promise and the fulfillment, actually having their baby. And I'm going to use a scary word here, but they fell into idolatry in a way because it's crazy something as pure and good as a promise from God became an idol to Abraham. And he displayed that through the fact that he was waiting and waiting and waiting. And he said, oh, I need to be a father. He conceived with a different woman. And that was a disaster. So maybe you have a word that you're standing on or a promise. Like if you feel like God's promised you a spouse and you've just been waiting forever, well, don't idolize the promise and invest your time and your heart in somebody that you know is not the fulfillment of that because you're going to make a wreck of your life until you get back on track and put God first. So you could write it down that way. Don't prioritize the promise over the promiser. It's idolatry. I mean, Abraham did it. He realized it was a mistake and he... You know, he always believed in the promise itself, but he, his priorities got out of order. Um, and I don't think I've ever heard the audible voice of God myself, but I do think that I've received clarity in just being quiet as a result of having been pressed into the Word and being intimate with God. So in times that we have need and specific needs, we can only stand on the Word. We can also seek God for a fresh and divine direction. And that leads me to my next point, which is that God's Word is authoritative. So if God's given you a word, that's authority, right? Isaiah 55, 10 and 11 says this, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, this is God, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it will not return empty, and it will accomplish what I purposed, 
succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So did God say he needs my help in that? Did he say my faith needed to be perfect? Did he say, I'm going to send out my word when you fill the faith tank up and then you, you combine it with what I said, then we've got, you know, that's the recipe. No, he didn't say that. See, his word is authoritative, so if he spoke it, he's faithful to complete it. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not. And so I want to go into this point that God is not limited by my faith. And that's great news because God does not, he's not waiting on me to reach this level of faith perfection for him to do what he's promised me he'll do. And you remember the story in Mark, um, I believe it's chapter 9, whenever the dad had his demon-possessed son, he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. After that, Jesus, you know, checked on his belief, he, and, and the man said, well, I believe, but just help me with my unbelief. You know, it didn't happen. That was, Jesus didn't say, hey, get your belief settled, and then I'm going to take care of you. You know, just like he didn't say, hey, get your self-perfect before we do this whole cross thing, right? He said, you're not perfect, but I am, so I'll take care of it. In that same way he did that for our salvation, he says, you, you're, you're still human. You're not going to be perfect. You may have doubt. Let me perform this miracle, and then we'll check and see what you're thinking after, right? And see, I hear it a lot point out um, the times that Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. People love to quote that. I think there's four instances in the gospel where that happens. But you know what Jesus did every time that he said that? He did the miracle anyway, right? And see, that's why Jesus said that with faith as small as a mustard seed, you can see the mountain move, right? Because my faith properly placed in an actual promise from God, even if there's a waiting period, it will be honored. So as long as I don't idolize it. See, God doesn't need me to max capacity faith. Like he's not... There's no price tag on that miracle. He doesn't need that. So I'll bring up Abraham again. He's standing on a promise. Of course he battled with unbelief. Of course we'll battle with that in our faith because some of the things God promises sound absurd. They're not natural, right? It's only natural that we'll doubt or that we'll have struggle. But I want to put two verses up side by side. In Romans, it's quoting the Old Testament, but it says the righteous will live by faith. And then in Genesis 15, he, Abraham, believed the Lord, and he, the Lord, counted it to him as righteousness. So you see, if the righteous live by faith, Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted as righteousness. Righteous live by faith, believe the Lord, counted to you as righteousness. You see how that works? It just takes belief, even if you struggle with it. So see, what I want us to take away from this portion of the text is just if I can get a word from God and choose to believe it, even if I'm wrestling with doubt, that's faith. That's what faith is. And it only takes a little bit of faith to see it come to pass. So it wasn't because I was short on faith that I didn't walk on the water of my swimming pool. It's because God didn't tell me I could walk on the water of my swimming pool. Right? I'm not Peter. That call wasn't to me. And what I find interesting about that story you know, there were other men in the boat when that storm happened. Peter was the one who literally had no faith and was scared to the point that he had to ask to get out. Like, why would I want to replicate that guy's faith? Because see, everybody else in the boat was just trusting, while they were scared, that Jesus was going to calm the storm. And then, you know, they were all freaking out. But what did he do? He calmed the storm. He didn't need them all to chill out first. But so Peter, you know, he had no faith to stay in the boat. He was called out to walk on the water. But I don't want to replicate that faith because you know, there's no formulas of faith. I don't want to replicate anybody's faith because faith is personal because God is personal. right? If he's going to meet a specific need in my life, it just takes that specific word and me holding on to it in faith. There's no recipe for it. So let's go back to that psalm, picking up at verse 5. We'll do 5 through 7, and then I just want to skip to verse 35. Let the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord, and who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. In verse 35, God says, Once for all I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie to David. So God is faithful, and also God is holy. So if there was one word that you could use to describe God, you know, I would argue that it's holy, and I would say, look at this here in verse 35. God 
you know, in this statement, what did he pick as like the most valuable thing to himself to then show how serious he was about being faithful? He said, I swear by my holiness, right? Does he, is he love? Yes. Is he, you know, beautiful? Yes. Is he powerful? Yes. But he said, I swear by my holiness, as if that's priority number one to me. We get a couple depictions in Scripture of encounters with God, Isaiah and Revelation, and the vision is just always, you know, the, the seraphim, the angels circling God, singing nothing but holy. That's what they cry. And God is so holy that, you know, Moses asked God, can I just see you in the Old Testament? And he said, you know, man, I wish, but if you did, you're toast. Like, you would die. So see, but we live under this covenant now with complete approachability to God through Jesus, but that doesn't mean that God is less holy. And so in my own study, and I've like wrestled with this at times because it's like, it's, it seems like a paradox. Like, okay, holiness means complete, set apart. God is the only one as holy as he is. And then if I'm as dead in sin as I was, you know, how is it that this is bridged? And you'll hear a lot of, you know, theology that either downplays the holiness or downplays our own sin. But if you do that... You're, you're minimizing the value of God's love, right? Because you want to hold that intention to realize, okay, that's how great God had to reach, and that's how strong His love has to be for me to be in community with Him, right? So that paradox itself, that seems like, okay, God is so holy that He cannot even let me see Him, yet I can receive Him closer than my very own skin, that should just spur your thoughts to realize, okay, I want to explore how holy God is in Scripture because, man, that just puts me in awe. It makes me realize how much He actually loves me. See, His holiness shows how great His love is. And this should influence the way I live because if I don't dwell on that and think about it, I'm not realizing the fullness of His love. And knowing how great His love is fills me with His Spirit. We know that from Ephesians 3 where it says this, "...according to the riches of His glory..." He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So I need to know the height and depth of His love to be filled with the fullness of it. So I don't want to ever minimize, oh, I wasn't that bad. Like, you know, sin isn't that big a deal. God could just pardon it. No, like that, it was unforgivable. And God is so holy, that juxtaposition shows me how great His love is. And I want to know how great His love is so that I can be filled with the fullness of God. Right? And I love what Oswald Chambers, um, he talked about faith and he said, the nature of faith is to make the object of our faith more real to me. So if you think about it, faith itself, when you see an answered prayer, the true reward is not even in the thing you prayed for being given to you. It's in the fact that your soul now realizes God heard you and answered you, and you, you matter to Him, and He's real. Does that make sense? So the most valuable benefit is that God has made more real to me. So if I believe for healing, and I receive it, it's great, I rejoice, but my soul is even more glad because now I know, okay, this God is, is real because God satisfies my soul more than anything in this world that's temporary. So as we seek Him for faith and a fresh word, my prayer is that the pursuit will lead us to realize that not even the answer to our faith questions and our faith pursuits is what we truly need. The pursuit itself brings us closer to God and God Himself is our reward. C.S. Lewis said that God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing. So in searching for answers to our questions and, and finding fulfillment of our needs, man, I want to remember that like, God is the actual joy of my heart and satisfaction of my soul. And true peace and joy are only found in his person. So my focus does not need to be, okay, you know, I've got this need for this you know, promotion or something in my job, and I'm full force of that, it's okay, you know, okay, God, you're my provider. And it may not even be this job because my faith is not assumptive, right? But I'm going to stand on your word that you provide for me, and I'm going to just seek you. And who knows where this job thing is going, but I know that you are my provider. And as I find more of you, I will feel more peace and security that money doesn't give me. 
And see, I felt burdened in studying this just to remember that coming to Christianity, if you remember like your conversion, if you got saved when you were older or the joy you felt as a kid when you were younger, it was the encounter with God that just made you realize, hey, I want God, right? You didn't say, you know, the sinner's prayer because you're like, you know, I, okay, because now I'll get God and then I can pray for these things and have them. Like, it's not the benefits, right? It's, it's God himself. It's not even a ticket to heaven. I mean, the thing about heaven, it's not like a place where we get massages and great meals and stuff. Like, if God wasn't there, heaven's not even heaven. It could be exactly the same, but take his person out, you go there and it's hell, right? An old teacher of mine used to say it this way, we often see God as a means to paradise rather than paradise himself. So in my experience of faith, of proper faith, of not just you know, meditating on the thing I need, but the one who can actually fulfill the promise, you know, I found that this genuine search of true faith leads me to remember that, that God is the only one who can settle me, and He is the prize and the reward. He's the only satisfaction in my heart. So just to sum all this up, hopefully it came together, but we need to seek God for faith. Jeremiah 29 13 says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. See, to get all of God, we need to give him all of our own heart. Are we doing communion? At the end? Yeah. And so I'll just conclude with this short prayer, and then we'll switch it over to communion. But God, as we seek you, in order to strengthen our faith, may we find that as we pursue you, you settle what it is that we're looking for. If it's security that comes through work or health, God, may we find that you are the only one who gives us true peace and that you fulfill our deepest desires. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right there, Dave. Um, right now, they're going to pass out the communion elements. Um, they're going to come down the, the aisles. And uh, you're welcome to take communion with us. If you're a believer, man, that's, that's what we celebrate. It is the the greatest testimony of what has been done for us in our lives by God himself. It is the uh, greatest picture of what love truly looks like when you hold these emblems, these symbols of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. Here you go, David. Don't worry. And uh, we're, we're going to do this together. And I wanted David to stay here because I want him to pray over each of these as, as you guys get them in your hands. <clears throat> so from what I got from David today is, if you're trusting God for anything, if you're believing God for anything, be certain that the highest priority of your heart and life is God himself. You never know the direction or the avenue that God will use to meet that desire of your heart. God knows the desires of your heart, and Scripture says that he will give you the desires of your heart as those desires are aligned with his heart. Tammy didn't know it, but she was looking for somebody six foot four with dark hair and a deep voice like this. She got me. And you know what she says all the time? I got the desire of my heart. She had a list of things. I mean, if you would agree, she got the best thing she could get. Y'all think I'm being funny, but it's true. There was a day there was a guy that was pursuing her who actually played Jesus at PTL. Did anybody remember what PTL was back in the day? He played Jesus. And his voice literally sounded like this all the time. And he was about six, he was six, seven, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was even less of a manly picture than me standing next to my son the day I went to go pick her up for a, um, just to go out. And he had actually thought he'd surprise her and pull up to where she worked. And I saw him standing there and thought, God, the desire of my heart's about to go to that vehicle and it will never be ever again. And I know that's a kind of a funny story, but Sometimes you need to trust God more than you trust yourself. And I think what David was saying there is we need to realize that the God we love, the God that we say we serve, is so holy, so set apart, so magnific magnificent, so filled with love, so awesome that only He knows what you desire and need better than yourself. And if you would focus on Him rather than a thing, because faith is not... Trust in something, it's trust in someone. I promise you, God will meet the desire of your heart. None of us could have imagined what it would take for salvation, yet we hold in our hands right now. I want you to take the top off to that little piece of uh, bread there, and then if you can, open up the other as well to the cup. We're going to take these together. 
I think Mel Gibson probably did the best job that any of us could ever visualize in a depiction of what Jesus would go through to purchase our salvation. To take on in God's eyes sin that he had never committed so that we could take on a righteousness that we would never be able to obtain. Jesus did that for us. And what you hold in your hands are the symbols of that love, the symbols of that gift, the symbols of the Father's heart for you. He loves you so much that he allowed his son to be tormented, brutalized beyond recognition. And then one day in a, in a meal with his disciples, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to change this up forever. And every time now you sit down to this Passover meal that used to represent one thing, it's now going to represent something else. And then Paul himself said, every time you take these, this bread, this cup, you bless it and receive what it signifies, the wholeness promised to you by God freedom, the righteousness, the love that was demonstrated through my son Jesus. David, would you pray over the bread? God, as we take this element, Lord, that represents your body, may we remember the sacrifice you made for us and how great that demonstrates your love. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's take it together. And as you hold this cup, it is the symbol of righteousness, that what Jesus did was sufficient to forgive you, to free you, to put you in right standing with God. It represents that. And when we take it today, if there's anything you've been holding on to, shame, guilt, or condemnation, sorrow, sadness from a past that just kind of keeps its claws in you, I want you today to be reminded of your forgiveness. David, go ahead and pray. God, may we remember that this blood covers all of our sins. And God, we may we remember the greatness of the price that you paid when you shed your blood for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's drink together. Amen. Well, how many of you are grateful for what Jesus has done for us? Yeah. And how many of you are thankful that my son, even though he accidentally texted me instead of his wife and said, hey, should I tell dad I'll speak? I thought he was going to tell you that. That's how it started. I got a text and it said, hey, should I tell dad that, I'm, that I'll speak for him? And I said, did you mean to send that to me? He said, well, I guess there's no more question. I'm, I'm obligated now, so... I'm glad he did this. Uh, yeah, yeah. And hopefully you, you receive something today. Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet with us this morning? I want to.